The Heiress is an episode that deals with the fallout from rodeo and mastectomy, as JR's schemes continue to roll on and the whole family has to adjust to Miss Ellie's health scare. Kristen is getting fed up with JR's emotional table scraps, but JR is prioritizing Jock's birthday over sex. That man is a goddamn saint. At dinner, Alan Beam. Alan, Alan Beam. Conveniently happens upon the table and tries to apologize to Jock for the staged events of Rodeo. JR lays into him again and they get some showy fisticuffs before Jock breaks it up. The play acting certainly works on Lucy, who gives Ellen her number. The next morning, Bobby asks if JR thinks Cliff is stupid enough to fall for the scheme, which just shows that Bobby overestimates Cliff's intelligence. Lucy's quip that the gossip section of the newspaper says Alan Beam would have wiped the floor with JR is delightful. At Barnes headquarters, Alan gets a young tank from the Matrix to sign up as a Barnes financial supporter. That's quite a get. Whoa. Of course, the kid has no money at that point, so Alan does him a solid and funds the donation from petty cash. So yeah, if you don't already know, that's like super illegal. Someone who is legal now is Lucy Ewing, and she offers the Barnes campaign $100. She and Alan make a date for later that night. Alan is, of course, conflicted, but given that Lucy is the heiress of the title, we can make a pretty good guess. The therapy, Sue Ellen gets in a great monologue about how John Ross III reminds her of how she was used by both Cliff and JR, and how it's hard not to take it out on the baby, even if it's not fair. She also credits LB for making her see that she's a real person and not just an NPC in someone else's life. LB tells her that she'll have to learn to trust again before she can get involved with Dusty Farlow. Back at Barnes HQ, Cliff is impressed by Alan Beam's pugilistic exploits with JR, but he's not quite ready to declare his candidacy. After all, JR destroyed his political career once before using a botched abortion, and Cliff isn't ready to let a candidacy be born just because Alan conceived it. It is ultimately Cliff's choice. Alan calls JR from Barnes HQ, which seems a little risky. Yeah? JR is hesitant to sink more money into the scheme, but Alan says candidate Cliff is ready to enter the world. He just needs the electoral fallopian tube to be lubed up by some more filthy lucre. I'm a wordsmith, you know. Pam B are struggling to find things to do that they can both agree on. For example, Pamela likes dancing in the hottest night spots in Dallas, and Bobby likes making her watch as he lobbies Texas officials to investigate her brother for malfeasance. But, you know, I'm not one to kink shame. Bobby claims Cliff is taking bribe money from other oil companies to allow them to drill while he stymies Ewing oil. Pamela, who is not exactly Vincent Bugliosi, asks a very simple question of whether Bobby has proof. And he has to admit that he doesn't. At the offices of Ewing Oil, the plot to dethrone Cliff Barnes is going a little too well, as Harv Smithfield, Alan's boss, offers to fire Alan for embarrassing JR in public. I wouldn't want it said that I had someone else fight my battles for me. Cliff gets some advice from his own counsel. Run! Bobby Ewing is lining up senator after senator to investigate Cliff's abuse of power, and he has mountains of support for a congressional run. If he stands pat, he might lose the OLM position anyway. This exchange does put Cliff's decision into perspective, as it's not just about Cliff being power hungry. Bobby and JR actually wound up working him from both ends. Cliff runs into Sue Ellen and inquires about the baby, but she is understandably cold to him. How's the baby? He's beautiful. Have a good day, Mr. Bond. Lucy busts out the old I'm studying at Muriel's play because Jock has grounded her on account of her speeding tickets, and Jock, Ruthless businessman who has swindled at least half a dozen people out of their land and oil falls for it. Never let it be said that he doesn't also have a blind spot. Pamela tells Cliff to ease up on the Ewings, but Cliff says he has to run in order to stop the rumored Asian oil well drilling, which would make the Ewing empire unstoppable. Pamela is puzzled to hear that the Ewings have purchased oil leases, since Bobby assures her that they're broke. At dinner, Alan and Lucy get along famously. Alan tries to let her down gently, but Lucy doesn't take no for an answer and agrees to keep their relationship a secret. In the closet, as it were. The next morning, Jock tells Bobby he's naive if he thinks that this can all be above board. Pamela confronts Bobby about the oil leases, which is the first time Bobby is hearing about any of this. Bobby does some digging in the old Rolodex and gets JR's partners to confirm the Asian oil well deal. Lucy tries the pop in on Alan Beam, but he's cruising in the park to clandestinely find another man. She is so angry and distraught that she speeds off and then snaps at Muriel. Back at therapy, Sue Ellen relates the story of running into Cliff and recognizing that Cliff doesn't want her. He wants J.R. Ewing's wife. And that has caused her to hate him. 
All he wants is what J.R. Ewing has, me and my son, and he'll do anything to get us. But he won't succeed because I won't let him succeed. Great stuff from Linda Gray, as always. We're introduced to Laura Johnson's Betty Lou Barker, who is Alan Beam's girlfriend. She overhears Lucy chewing Alan out and says that she's been patient as long as she can, but Alan and JR's relationship is starting to come between them. Oh, come on! Alan tells her he needs space. Space to woo and to marry Lucy Ewing long enough to get rich. Betty Lou is, to put it lightly, cool to the idea. Alan tells JR that their cover is blown, but JR says he'll think of something. Note that Kristen tries to pry, but JR keeps her in the dark as much as possible. Like her older sister, Kristen says that she's okay with certain parameters for their relationship, but she really wants more. JR, clever fiend that he is, fakes being on a phone call just within Lucy's earshot and makes her think that the meeting with Alan was more innocent than it was. Bobby finally confronts JR about the Asian oil wells and why they're off the Ewing books. JR's logic is unassailable. You know as well as I do, we can't afford right now to drill overseas. Can't afford not to, Bobby. That brother-in-law of yours has us tied up in Texas, but he can't touch us overseas. Bobby demands to know where the money is coming from, and JR gets evasive. I don't like people checking up on me. Well, that's too bad. Because I'm going to find out what's going on. Alan smooths things over with Lucy, and they go to bed. Curiously, she offers him a bite of her apple while they're in bed. Alan refuses, citing Eve and opts to stick with his grapes. Nope. No queer reading to be had here. Making it all up. And we're out. We're not quite halfway through season three yet, but we're starting the ball rolling in earnest toward the conclusion of the season arc. Thankfully, as much as I love my Susti content, they give it a bit of a rest this week in favor of Sue Ellen's growth as a person. This continues with her recognition that the affair with Cliff wasn't between Cliff and Sue Ellen, but between Cliff and JR's wife, which is a role that has defined her for far too long. But there's a lot more going on here too. Bobby is about to expose JR's Asian oil well deal, which will have far reaching implications for Jock and Ellie, a woman for whom legacy has to be at the forefront of her mind. Ellen's audible to cast off Betty Lou Barker for the much richer Lucy Ewing will also complicate matters for all three. The Eris is a fine setup episode, and a fantastic payoff has yet to come. <laughs>